Okay, great. It looks like uh, we have a few more people join us here. Um, so I think we're ready to get going. Thanks so much um, for attending. I'm uh, super excited to talk to you today. Um, for those who don't know me, I see a few familiar names, but um, my name is Patrick Little. I'm the product owner for the Government of Canada's Open Data Portal. And um, this session today, I'm, uh, I'm excited to, um, to present kind of a new format for me. I haven't tried this before, but um, I was really inspired by um, a YouTube uh, a YouTuber that I've watched a lot of videos from called Domain of Science, um, where, you know, on a single sort of infographic, talking through a whole um, sort of knowledge domain area. So um, in this session, I'm going to sort of talk through this infographic um, around all things sort of open data. We're going to talk on all sorts of different um, subject matters and best practices for releasing open data. Um, I'm, I'm thinking probably talk for about 40 minutes and then leave um, a good portion at the end where we can have um, sort of, you know, open question, like open discussion maybe, um, or um, just answer questions from folks. Um, in terms of like sort of housekeeping, um, feel free to use the chat. Um, but for any like questions that you'd like to discuss in the, um, at the end, like during the discussion period, if you could put those in the Q and A section, um, that allows for like just a little bit better of a workflow um, for the question and answers. So um, that said, I think we'll get into it. So to start out, what is open data? So open data is defined as structured data that is machine readable, freely shared, used and built on um, without restrictions. So, you know, do you know how much of your tax money is spent on government contracts? Do you want to know how fuel efficient a car you're thinking of buying is compared to other cars on the market? Do you um, know how the climate of Canada is changing over time? And um, maybe more relevant to our current situations, do you want to know how COVID-19 is affecting different segments of the population differently? These are all questions that can be opened that can be answered by open data. And by releasing open data, we can empower stakeholders and citizens to make informed decisions, to build or grow their business, um, to better understand particular issues, and to hold the government accountable. Um, beyond that, there's more benefits of open, op, op, of open data. And um, I'll talk to that a bit. The graphic on the screen here is from the uh, European Commission's Open Data Gold Book for Managers. And I'll talk to um, some of the individual aspects here. So support for innovation, um, access to data, to open data, um, supports innovation in the research and private sectors by um, reducing duplication and promoting the reuse of um, existing resources. Um, the ability of data in machine readable um, formats allows for creative mashups that can be used to analyze markets, predict trends, um, and direct their businesses in making strategic investments. Um, we can have um, open data for, um, for unrestricted access to scientific data for public interest purposes. Um, we can have better support for um, consumers to make informed decisions. So by providing access to public sector information, um, consumers can, for example, um, use real-time air travel statistics to help choose an airline and understand the factors that can lead to flight delays. Um, and this gives Canadians a say in the decisions that affect them and the resulting potential for innovation and value. Um, proactive disclosure, this is something that, you know, Government of Canada folks would be super familiar with, but proactively publishing data that is relevant to Canadians reduces the amount of formal Freedom of Information Act requests or Access to Information Act requests um, and greatly reduces the burden um, associated with responding to these inquiries. 
So, you know, these are just, um, you know, some of the benefits that, that open data can give us. Um, in order to realize these benefits though, organizations and institutions um, generally will sign up to, or establish some sort of agreement or even establish legislation that requires um, open data. In academia, um, one of the most popular sort of open data agreements is the Sorbonne Declaration on Research Data Rights. Um, this declaration was signed by over 200 of the top uh, world's 200 of the world's top universities um, affirming their commitment to share research data under the FAIR principles. So what are the FAIR principles? We have findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, findable is the first step in using or reusing data. Um, metadata in the data should be easy to find for both humans and computers. Machine readable metadata is essential for automating this discovery of data sets and services. We can achieve um, findable by ensuring our data sets are assigned unique IDs, by describing our data with rich metadata, and by making our metadata available in searchable catalogs or indexes. Next, um, once we have findable, we, we're going to want to have accessible. So once the user finds the required data, they need to know how it can be accessed and um, what sort of you know, credentials do they need to access it, or is it open data? Um, by making the metadata retrievable and including this access information within the metadata, such as the license, um, we, can, we can ensure our data and our open data is is accessible. Another um, feature here is making your metadata available even when the data itself um, is no longer available. After findable and accessible, we, we're going to need to have interoperable data. So for sophisticated reuse, this data, the open data that you're going to publish, um, is going to likely need to be integrated with other um, with other data sets in order to, you know, really um, realize the benefits of that data. Um, the data needs to be able to interoperate with other applications and workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. Um, and we can achieve um, this interoperability by having data sets and metadata use formalized and shared um, language for knowledge representation for knowledge representation, having formalized vocabularies used within data sets available, and um, making linkages to other data sets and metadata records. After, um, after findable, accessible, interoperable, and then we're gonna have reusable. So um, the, the ultimate goal of the FAIR um, the FAIR principles is to optimize the reuse. And to achieve this, um, metadata and data should be well described so that it can be, um, you know, in the case of research data, the, the research can be replicated or it can be combined into different settings. Um, this is achieved by having a clear and accessible data usage license, having uh, detailed provenance information for data sets and using domain relevant standards um, for data sets and metadata. Within the government of Canada, the, the sort of perspective that I best bring to the table, um, we have an administrative policy known as the Directive on Open Government that states that all data resources of business value held by the government of Canada should be open by default and released as open data and less subject to, you know, valid exceptions like ownership, um, security, privacy of, of uh, citizens, and confidentiality. In addition to um, the FAIR principles, there's other sets of principles commonly used um, within organizations that publish open data. Um, for example, the International Open Data Charter 
for which Canada has adopted, um, instead of having the FAIR principles, they sort of unpack it in a different way. The, the six principles they, um, they, they um, have are open by default, timely and comprehensible, accessible and reusable, comparable and interoperable, um, and designed for improved governance and citizen engagement, and designed for development and innovation. So whether you're um, operating in a framework where FAIR is really um, the focus, or um, whether you're operating under the Open Data Charter, um, the, the outcomes produced by these principles are really going to align very closely. Um, so one way to describe the key features of open data is the concept of availability and access, reuse and redistribution, and universal participation. I think this list of, of the three features of open data was um, really led by the Open Knowledge Foundation. But within the Government of Canada, we've also adopted this list of features and um, you know, we feature this on our like Open Data 101 web website. So I've, uh, for the rest of the presentation, um, we're going to structure we're going to structure our content around those three themes. Um, so far, we've just sort of set a bit of um, foundation, and now we'll get into each of the three feature areas and explain um, best practices to achieve success in each one of these areas. So. To kick it off, we'll start with um, availability and access. Let me adjust the screen here. Yeah, that should be good. Um, so availability and access, this feature is described as um, the data must be available as a whole and that no more than a reasonable reproduction cost, preferably on the internet, and the data must also be available in a convenient and modifiable form. So starting with the availability aspect, um, opening up data online is really the way to go. Um, you know, especially um, in you know, 2020, 2021, the prospect of waiting to um, get maybe a CD-ROM in the mail from the government with the data that you want, or um, you know, even like going into a library to flip through um, microfiche catalogs and stuff like that. You know, for, for most folks, that hasn't been really possible. Um, so ensuring our, our open data and our data is available online um, is really the way to go. When it comes to making your open data available online, you know, there's tons of different technology options available out there to host your open data. And we could, you know, certainly fill a whole session by um, looking at the multitude of different technology solutions out there, comparing the different features. Um, but um, we'll just go, you know, quickly over some of the most common ones. Um, and if you're, yeah, if you're someone who maybe is early in the open data journey for your organization, um, you know, maybe this is, is um, great information for you. Um, so when it comes to um, choosing a platform, organizations will want to factor in what type of features they'd like to have within, within their open data catalog, along with um, other things such as the cost of operations and the type of technical expertise they have to, to operate such a platform. For open data portal software, there's really two different delivery models out there on the market currently. So um, the first one, the first type is open source. Um, and this means really that the software is free to download and run, but organizations will need to provide their own infrastructure, meaning like servers, to host the application. Um, they could host this either in servers that they have, you know, on premises in their own data center or it could be using infrastructure from a commercial cloud provider. Um, some of the most popular sort of open source um, open data catalog software is um, CCAN. 
you know, this is used by Canada, the UK government, USA, um, and many other provincial, national um, open data portals. There's also a DCAN, which is very, very similar to CCAN, um, but instead of being written in the Python programming language, it's written in um, a programming language called PHP, and um, it's highly integrated with another software called Drupal, which is a, sort of a website building software. Um, there is Invinio, um, which is another open source one that um, was developed by CERN um, to host their to host their data. Um, and then there's also Socrata that has um, different versions. There's an open source version um, and a um, proprietary version that you need to pay a license for as well. The other, the other model sort of um, for open data portal software is a software as a service. So as opposed to you having um, servers that you run and control, you can um, have another provider um, operate the portal for you, just like um, you would, you know, maybe sign up for a Netflix uh, account would be maybe a bit of a simplified um, way that that works, um, and they'll operate the portal for you. There's few a few different ones that operate in the software as a service model. There's um, Socrata has an enterprise version that you can use in the software as a service model. Um, Esri has their um, ArcGIS open data um, product. There's also uh, Data Network, um, DataHub.io. Um, those are all ones. Um, using that software as a service model. Um, if your organization is at the stage of selecting a platform to share your open data, um, the European Commission has a great research paper available about um, what the types of features are um, and some, some best practices around selecting that. Um, and this, this, is just, this research paper is just over a year old. Um, so the information is still like pretty up to date with all the um, with all of the sort of most current information. Um, the World Bank also has a useful section on their open data toolkit, um, but that's getting a bit dated. It's about five or six years old, but um, both of those links are, will be in the reference section of this presentation, which I think is, is getting shared widely. Um, then I'll say, um, if your organization is just getting started on your sort of open data journey, I wouldn't let catalog or a, a portal software be the barrier to stop you from, you know, releasing your first data set or um, making some data available out there. If you just have a few key data sets that, uh, that you want to release, um, you know, as, as a dipping your toe in the water activity, you know, just putting those available, or putting, putting those files and making them available on just a regular, on your regular organization website is a great place to start. Um, and then you can use that as a jumping off point um, to define requirements for the features that you'd like to have when you move forward. Um, okay. So once you have your, your open data program sort of up and running, one of the challenges we hear from stakeholders is uh, where can I find information um, within my organization to make available as open data? Um, if you're an organization that is producing like really high quality um, data sets as your primary activity, like maybe a, a national statistical, statistical office, like a Stats Canada or something like that, then maybe this isn't a, a huge issue for you. But for other organizations that might be sort of less mature in managing data as a strategic asset, then actually sort of tracking down the data that you have um, can be a challenge for folks. Um, there's a few sort of low hanging fruit ways to find data sets that you might already have that could be released as open data. Um, the first place to check is right on your own department, your own um, organization's website. Um, so you might have data up there. Um, maybe it's, 
you know, in a PDF, or maybe it's um, someone took the time to code it out into an HTML table, um, and it's presented directly on a web page. We'll, we'll see more uh, um, later in the presentation on that, but that type of data is difficult for, for folks to use and reuse. So taking that data and publishing it in a machine-readable open data set is a great way to get started um, if you're new to publishing open data as an organization. Um, a second place to, to look is look at the data that you need to report to other institutions. Um, if, if you have data that you need to periodically report, this might be a good place um, to start at uh, looking at creating a data set on that type of data on that data. Um, for finding for finding data to publish, one method that many organizations who are doing open data have tried is um, doing a targeted sort of open data inventory where um, or areas within organizations are asked to provide lists of all of their data holdings and indicate whether they'd be good uh, candidates for releases open data. This was really popular in the sort of open data community in the mid 2010s, I guess. Um, like I know, for example, the USA, Canada, um, and other jurisdictions all took on this type of open data inventory activities during, uh, during that time frame. Well, some organizations may have had pretty good success with that. Um, I don't think many organizations saw the level of completeness um, in those inventories that was desired, uh, meaning that they were really left with an incomplete inventory. And that was certainly our experience in the Government of Canada um, when we did that activity. What we've heard um, from organizations that are having more access with an, with an inventory approach is um, having a more fulsome enterprise data inventory as opposed to targeted inventories designed only for open data. Um, going, going to um, a, a data inventory that's required for, for more activities than just open data in, ensures uh, better adoption um, and more fulsome participation if you are um, actually trying to, to locate a good amount of data. Well, um, the invent data inventories may have had some success. As the volume and the velocity of data that organizations create and want to keep track of, um, there becomes a point when manually tracking this in like an inventory that a person has to fill out um, is just becomes untenable. So what leading organizations do um, is they'll have con comprehensive enterprise data catalogs that automatically track the various sort of data warehouses, data lakes, database clusters, those type of sources of data um, that the institution is managing. So some of the sort of products to do that, um, there's um, the Azure Data Catalog, Apache Atlas, um, there's some open source ones like Amundsen that um, the ridechain company Lyft developed to um, manage, keep track of the data in their organization um, and many others. So if you're looking for the data within your organization, um, I'd find out if you have an enterprise data catalog and um, try and get access to that as a source of um, places to look to find open data. Um, the other, the other place. So, you know, thinking about it so far, we've talked about the supply side um, of of finding open data to, to open. The other, the other way to think about it is um, the demand side. So, take suggestions. Um, that's a great way. So, um, having having a feature for functionality where um, users can request data or suggest data that they'd like to um, see made as available as open data by your organization um, is also, you know, a great way. This, this functionality can, can be sort of 
um, involved, like where you have um, the ability to like track the requests over time and, and maybe vote or comment in that. Or it could just be as simple as having a, an email address listed on your website saying, hey, um, if you're looking for a data set or you know of data that you'd like to see published, email us here. Um, that can also be can also be effective. Okay, so um, now let's say we've we've uh, we have a platform. We found some data to open up. How are we going to release this data? Um, so here we're going to talk about um, some of the best practices really around releasing data. Um, so. Um, going back to what we mentioned at the start of this section, we want to make our open data available in a convenient and modifiable form. And uh, one way to quantify this sort of convenience and modifiableness um, of your open data is the commonly used five-star open data scheme. Um, this, is, this is widely used um, by organizations that publish open data. Um, so to start off, we'll start with the one star open data. Here, to get one star, all you got to do is make something available online under an open license. We'll talk about licensing um, a bit later on in the presentation. But an example of one star would be maybe you take a picture of a PDF um, that has a table in it, and then you post that on your website under an open license, but just as an image. Um, so this is great. A person can can take that data um, and really do whatever they want with it under, excuse me, the terms of their license of the license that you've used. But it's not really very usable or modifiable, right? If I want to get the data out of that picture, I'm, I'm probably going to have to manually retype it in, um, or maybe I have an advanced sort of um, scraping tool that takes images and um, combines them to tables, but more likely than not, I'm going to be um, retyping it. Next, after one star, we have two stars. So here we're going to make the data available as structured data, but in a proprietary format. So an example of this is um, releasing Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. So when we have two star, it's great. Now we can um, access and modify the data, and it's machine readable, but access to this data um, relies on proprietary software. So, um, you know, if I don't want to pay for a Microsoft license, well, then maybe I can't get my data. For Excel, you know, generally this isn't a huge deal, but there's other common formats that the licenses are extremely expensive. After we have our uh, one star, two star, then we get into three star. Um, so, for three star, we have all the features that we have within our two star open data, but now we're going to release this in a non proprietary format. So the classic example here is release your data as CSV as opposed to Microsoft Excel. Um, three stars is generally the minimum target for publishing open data in most institutions. Um, and this is a great happy medium for most consumers of open data. Um, when you have sort of CSV data, non-data savvy folks can can still, you know, download the data from your organization's website, um, and they can interact with it using familiar tools that um, you don't have to be a programmer or developer to use, um, like Microsoft Excel. But nearly every sort of major data analysis package um, is going to su support. Um, importing CSV data. So whether you're using something like Python, R, SAS, MATLAB, you know, any one of these sort of data analysis stacks are going to um, support um, importing data in CSV. After um, three-star, we have our four-star open data. Um, so to get four-star open data, we're going to release our data um, in a in a uh, resource description framework, RDF format, um, we could use um, XML or um, JSON-LD or Turtle um, as the actual file type. But 
Downside to um, to publishing at this four star level is that likely only data experts are going to be able to consume this this data, um, and because and it's also difficult. You need to have specialized data publishing expertise to publish this type of data. Um, so since it's um, you know so complicated to work with for for the public for open data users. Um, if you're publishing four star, we also recommend you know that you publish it in a tabular format in addition, if um, wherever possible. Um, and then after after four star, we have our five star open data. So um, you're going to have a sort of similar data structure as you would for four star, but now in five star open data, you're going to apply an ontology an ontology to describes um, the linkage between the data elements. Um, and really, um, this goes from, you know, putting your data on the web um, as a file to download and really making it in the web. So um, making it fully like in as in, it's like the data is now a part of the internet rather than being just on the internet. Um, so basically, as we what we said is three star data CSV format is is a good um, good target to um, aim for. And now that we've established, um, we want to release some CSV data sets. What are what are some of the things we need to consider um, when releasing our CSVs? This section here could be a whole presentation um, itself, which I've um, done presentations on that many times, but um, we'll go over some of the sort of basics here. Um, so just as a bit of an introduction to tabular data, um, a well-structured data set, in a well-structured data set, each row of the data set should be an observation of the data. Each column in the data set should be a variable that describes that observation of the data. Um, and with, with this, you might, you might see that, um, sort of turned on its side, um, in wide data format, where instead of having each row be an observation of the data, of the data set, of the data rather, um, each column will be an observation of the data, and then your rows will be the variables. This, this is often popular for like tracking things over time in like a, in a PDF publication, um, but that it's gonna require the user to transpose the data before they're gonna be able to really do much analysis on it for the most part. Um, so you wanna understand that relationship between long data and wide data. Character encoding is another huge issue or another common issue that we see all the time um, with people publishing data. This is particularly important in a Canadian context um, where we need to use French accented characters in our data sets. Um, if you are just using like the ASCII, um, ANSI encoding, if you have French accented characters in your data set, when a user goes to open it, It'll show up as just a bunch of weird characters. Um, so you, you really need to be using UTF-8 character encoding um, if you have any accented characters. But really, you should just set that as your default. Always use UTF-8. Um, the other one we've seen a lot recently is um, HTTP, HTTPS. So making sure that any data that you're hosting um, at a link, at a URL, um, has secure HTTP enabled. This likely won't be an issue for you if you're an organization that's setting up you know, a brand new open data portal. Um, but for folks who have been operating data portals for some time, you know, they probably have a lot of existing content on there. Making sure that those, the links, the download links to the data is in HTTPS is huge because for the last, I don't know, a year or two, Google Chrome has been blocking downloads of um, files that are in HTTP. So 
user might come to your open data portal, say, yep, this looks like the data I want, click download, nothing happens. Then they click download again, nothing happens, then they leave and move on to something else. Um, this is because Google and other browsers are blocking this insecure file type. Um, so making sure that you have your, your all your URLs in HTTPS um, is really critical to stop you um, and your support team maybe from, from getting overwhelmed by issues from users. The next thing I'll talk about is dates. Um, so whenever you're releasing dates in your in, in open data sets, um, use the ISO 8601 date format, meaning you know four characters for the year, two characters for the month, two characters for the day. Um, if you don't do this, you know, how is a user going to know, for example, if you have 6 slash 7 slash 2021, do you mean the 7th of June or the 6th of July? Um, even if, And even if you say maybe in your data dictionary that this is the date format that you're going to use, what if they want to link that data with another data set? Well, then they have to keep track of which data set used, which date encoding, um, and then you know, do a, a data manipulation exercise to change that before they can actually um, re, reuse that data. Um, so just as a standard, use the 8601 um, date formats. The other thing that we that we see a lot um, with, with users publishing um, with data sets, with our organization, rather the Government of Canada publishing data sets, is that we see they, that data publishers are including non-tabular information within their tabular data sets. So, you know, we often see sort of low maturity data publishers include like a bunch of notes or explanations um, within the actual tabular data at the bottom. Um, well, we know that, you know, the intention is good that they want to explain, um, you know, the nuances of their data set. Really, those notes and other things need to be in separate documentation files. Um, th there shouldn't be anything in your data set that isn't an observation of the data or the header row of the data set. Um, and yeah, moving this, this information into a simple text file to share along with the data set, um, or you could, you know, include this information within the metadata of the data set or um, doing a more sort of data dictionary and, and guide. Those are all valid approaches. Um, so those are some of the, the biggest main issues that we see um, with publishing tabular data. Um, now that we know sort of some of the common errors to look out for, is there anything that I can that you can look at to make sure that you've done it right? answer is yes. Um, there's a few tools out there that can automatically check the structure of, you know, a tabular data set to make sure that you have it right. Um, the two that I'd recommend are Good Tables or CSV Lint. These are both free um, open source projects. I think they're both um, supported by the Open Data Institute. Um, and they'll, be, they'll um, give you a good sort of check on your data set to make sure you don't have any structural issues. Um, so before publishing tabular data, I definitely recommend um, running the file through the, either one of those tools. Okay, so I think we have the sort of availability part of availability and access down. Um, so let's mention a few things now on access. Um, one question you might have is, how do I treat data sets that get deleted. You know, maybe the data is no longer available. It was on a legacy server that, you know, had to get decommissioned or, or something like that. Um, one of the features from our from our FAIR um, data um, was making the metadata available for a data set, even when the original data set itself is no longer available. Um, this can be sort of um, treated in different ways with uh, by different institutions. Some folks, um, some organizations will mark data sets as archived, um, for example. In the Government of Canada, what we do 
is we publish a standalone data set of all the data sets that were deleted, um, along with some of the metadata, um, some of the core metadata for all of those data sets. Um, and yeah, that's for, for access, that's something um, to consider when publishing open data. Um, another thing that around access that I've uh, started to become more aware of over the years when working on the Government of Canada's Open Data Program is the desire from certain stakeholders to be able to um, complete sort of basic tasks on the Open Data Portal anonymously. So for example, if you have a um, suggested data set feature on your portal, um, having the ability to anonymously suggest a data set was something um, strongly advocated for by our stakeholders. Um, for some of your of your stakeholders, providing personal information to a government or other big institution may be a barrier to participation. So for us, we've taken it as a best practice to not require a user to provide any information to us unless it's really um, you know required for for us to deliver that service. So for example, if you submit a access to information request to the government, well, we need to know at least like what your email address is so that we can send you the, the, the package of data. Um, or if you ask us to mail you a CD, well, we gotta know where to mail it to. But other than that, we try to minimize the amount of personal information we collect um, on our, through our open data portal. Okay, um, so that's availability and access. Now we're gonna switch gears over to um, reuse and redistribution. So for reuse and redistribution, um, we're defining that, or the, the feature of reuse and redistribution is that the data must be provided under terms that permit reuse and redistribution, including the intermixing with other, with other data sets. Um, so, zoom in a bit on, on this. Um, so one of the best ways to ensure your data is reusable is to reuse it yourself for your own internal purposes. Um, in the software development world, this is often referred to as dog fooding or eating your own dog food, um, meaning that in order to develop good software for other people to use, um, you need to use that software yourself and identify the sort of bugs and pain points that you experience as a user and then fix those for other users. This is hugely applicable to open data, um, specifically for government data producers. Um, so for example, I recently had um, someone in the government of Canada contact me. They are, are someone who actually produces open data. Um, and they were saying, hey, I tried to import um, this data set from the government of Canada's open data portal into Power BI but it was giving them some sort of weird server configuration issue or something. Um, so it took our, our um, technical team, our dev team, a little bit to sort of track down that issue, troubleshoot and fix it. But that's actually great news. You know, This means that the person producing that data was, was saying, hey, this data is fit, is fit for purpose for something that they want to do internally, maybe for a dashboard or something. And that means that, you know, if it's good enough for the internal producer of that data to use, it's likely pretty good for external people to consume, to consume too. Um, organizations generally spend a ton of time um, developing business intelligence products to keep their sort of management, senior management informed on what's going on. Um, and the data, the type of data contained in these sort of business intelligence products is rarely, you know, super detailed at the um, individual taxpayer or individual healthcare data level. Um, so oftentimes this data is really the, the best type of data to target um, for open data. If you can open up that data, this, that powers, if you can open up the data that powers these business intelligence products, um, and use that as the sort of single source of truth for any KPI that you're doing within your organization, um, that, 
that will ensure that the data sets you're publishing are are fit for purpose and that they're going to be updated um, frequently enough. Next within um, the section, we'll talk about slicing, dicing, drilling, and pivoting. Um, so as mentioned in our accessibility section, we want to make our data sets available and we want to include as many data features within that data set as possible. This leaves um, the options open to data users to um, sort of analyze that and aggregate that data in any way they want. Um, going back to the benefits of open data that we discussed, it's often that novel view on the existing data that can drive the benefit um, from it. Um, but that said, these type of sort of OLAP data transformations might be out of reach for the average citizen. Um, so leading open data producers will make the full data set available for folks who um, can, can do that type of analysis, but also will um, slice and dice it and break it down in different ways to make that analysis accessible um, for the public. Another way to really empower non um, sort of technical um, data users um, to gain insights from the open data is, you're producing is providing a data visualization. Um, this is particularly relevant for high value or large data sets. Um, there's a ton of different technologies available for doing online data visualizations like you know, Looker, Tableau, Google Data Studio, Power BI. Um, all of these would allow an open data portal operator to create nice web visualizations um, and allow um, folks to have a user interface on the data. Open data teams with more resources um, might look at um, doing your own sort of highly customized uh, visualizations using a tool like um, d3.js, but um, but you know that comes with uh, like a resource cost, and it also might reinforce um, assumptions on what users are trying to do with that data. Another great way to enable the reuse of your open data is by providing API, API access to the data. Um, for open data portals, there's really two types of APIs we're concerned about. The first type of API is um, an API that will provide metadata um, to your open to your open data sets. Um, this type of API would allow a user to query your data catalog and return results about your data set. So for example, if I wanted to know how many data sets related to COVID-19 the government of Canada has published, this is something I could use the API to track um, over time. Maybe I run this as a script every day that tracks you know, the graph of how many data sets we've released. Um, but that's only for the metadata. What if I want to access the actual data, them, the data sets themselves? Um, so this is something that the government of Canada, for, for us, we're just getting into providing API endpoints on individual data sets. Um, once you put the data in, in your API and you make it queryable, you know, you, like I was saying before, your data really goes from being on the web where it's just a file to download to being in the web, uh, meaning people can um, dynamically build on top of this API to um, access the data and repurpose it for their own use. Um, Okay, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about uh, metadata quickly. Um, one of the big drivers on how easy it is to find your open data and reuse it um, is going to be metadata. Um, there are um, really two areas of metadata that we're concerned about. One is the meta, like the actual what metadata to collect, and then the second area is how do I um, express that metadata to provide optimi optimized findability. So for example, for a more traditional search engine optimization. Um, in terms of deciding what metadata to collect, there are a number of things to consider. Um, you know, at a 40,000 foot view, sort of 
you want to determine what the metadata standards used in your um, sort of domain is and um, try and adopt common standards. Um, so if you're a geospatial data producer, maybe you want to um, adopt the ISO 19115, um, or if maybe you're a statistical organization, maybe you'd want to look at um, SDMX for your statistical metadata. Um, but you want to align to common standards. Um, for open data portal operators, there's different ways you can express that um, metadata on your on your actual portal. Um, one thing, one tidbit from from the government of Canada that um, we've had success with is using schema.org metadata. So um, with when once we adopted schema.org metadata. That allowed our data sets to get indexed into Google Dataset Search. Um, and um, that was really a big traffic driver for us. We've seen, you know, in some months up to 10% um, of our traffic coming to the portal from the Google Dataset Search. Okay, I'm noticing I'm a bit, I only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna go quickly on the universal participation section. Um, so in this section, the first thing we're gonna talk about is licensing. Um, for open data, there's really two types of licenses that we want to um, look at. The first one is um, software licenses. We'll, we'll look at that one first. If you're someone who um, is participating in an open source project, um, for, for your open data portal, um, being familiar with the um, different types of software licenses is gonna be um, important for you. Um, but for open data, we're really worried about content licenses. And a content license is really designed um, for content, whereas software licenses are really designed for, the, for software. Um, so just highlighting the fact that there's a difference um, in the two types of license you might use. Um, when, when you're publishing open data, you want to select a license that um, suits your requirements. So um, there's Creative Commons licenses, which we have see here on the page, but um, many other governments have adopted their own custom licenses. Um, the UK really led the charge on that with their open government license. Um, that's since been sort of adapted and reused by a number of government institutions. Um, but um, recently we've been having, you know, people ask us why, why do we need our own custom license? Why can't we just um, adopt one of the Creative Commons licenses? And that's a good question. That's something that we're actually um, looking at now. Um, and if you're a new open data producer, I'd encourage you to adopt an existing license that's widely understood by um, by the community rather than a roll your own approach where now stakeholders have to uh, understand the terms and conditions of your license and get familiar with using it. Um, next for universal participation, we're gonna talk about accessibility. Um, so, Web accessibility um, is has is um, you know something that's um, mandatory for the for most institutions to do for the government of Canada for sh for sure, but most large organizations is um, is um, covered by some sort of requirement to publish um, in an accessible way. Um, for open data, there's really um, the concept of making your content accessible, but also the platform itself. Um, one thing to highlight here, within um, the web accessibility guidelines, there's um, a concept saying that content on the web needs to fully conform with the specifications. So that means if you're gonna publish a CSV, in order for it to be considered accessible, that CSV needs to be a fully, fully properly formed CSV. The same applies to a JSON or an XML or something like that. Um, so this is something that we're working on getting better at within the government of Canada. Um, 
And something too is that um, this work isn't just for um, accessibility purposes. The improvements that you make in your metadata and um, your, your the structure of the data sets themselves helps make the usability of the data better for everybody. Um, and then just briefly on usability, um, one thing that we're focused on recently is um, providing plain language descriptions for data sets so that they can be more accessible um, to the general public. We know that, look, it's important to have detailed documentation on your data sets for your core stakeholders, um, but providing a plain language description is also, um, is also important and valuable um, so that people can understand, am I even looking in the right place for something? If it's outside of their sort of domain expertise. Okay, that took me a little bit longer um, than I was thinking it would to get through. I apologize. There's not many, quite much time left for questions. I know um, folks probably have other sessions that they want to go to, but if there are questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q and A um, box, and you know I'm happy to stay for um, for as long as possible. Um, we'll see if I don't think the moderator will end it on us if we're still talking. Um, but I am not seeing any questions yet. Okay, um, someone's saying yes. I'd love to have a copy of that placemat graphic. Um, yes, for sure. I think the slide materials will be um, distributed um, afterwards. Maybe I'll zoom it out. If anyone wants to take a screenshot of it um, <laughs> right now, um, I don't have it uploaded anywhere where I can share the link just yet. Apologies. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I will um, say thank you very much for um, for attending. I don't know. I don't remember if I if I mentioned this at the start, but um, this sort of placemat um, graphic was really inspired by a YouTube channel that I watch called uh, Domain of Science. Um, so um, that's where I kind of got the idea for this format. Um, I see Annette is asking for a link. I, I haven't uploaded this anywhere yet. I'm hoping that the slide materials will be um, distributed by the conference organizers. Um, but um, if Annette is who I think Annette is, then I'm happy to um, just send it to you by email. Oh, the research paper. Um, yes. Okay. Um, I have, let me just see if I can copy and paste this whole thing. Let's see what it looks like. Um, okay. One second. I will definitely put the link. Yeah, um, so that's the link there to the um, Open Data Portal one. All right, so I'm not I'm not seeing. Um, any other questions? And um, seeing the uh, moderator saying um, we're going to end in one minute. So um, thank you very much for for those um, that attended. Apologies, I I uh, took a bit longer to go over the material than maybe I thought I would. Um, I was hoping to have a bit more time for questions and stuff, but it looks like we're not getting a ton of questions anyway. 